The people have always been interested in blood. They knew it was linked to life, and they knew that losing it was linked to death. But they didn't know what it was made of, what it did, or how it did it. But they believed that blood was central to our being, vital to our lives. And that's why for hundreds and hundreds of years, it's been referred to as lifeblood. Today, we know quite a bit about blood, and researchers are continuing to learn more. But it took a long time to gain this understanding. And along the way, there were some misconceptions and beliefs that were, well, just plain wrong. The ancient Greeks and Romans believed the body was composed of four humors, blood, phlegm, black bile, and yellow bile. They thought disease was caused by an imbalance of these humors in the body. As a matter of fact, a Roman doctor named Galen believed that blood was formed in the liver and had no idea that the heart pumped blood through the arteries and veins. It wasn't until the 1600s, way over a thousand years later, that it was understood that blood circulates throughout the body pumped by the heart. But even with this knowledge, there was still not a clear understanding of the function of blood in our bodies. For instance, up until the end of the 19th century, doctors still used bloodletting to try to cure disease. They believed that bad blood made people sick, so they'd open up their patients' veins to get that bad blood out. It was a common practice, and sometimes they went a little too far. Did you know George Washington died from excessive bloodletting? Neither did I, but he did. But back to the question, what is blood? Well, in one sense, it's a transport system. This is how it works. As we evolved from one cell to many, it became necessary to develop a means by which all cells could get food, oxygen, and information. In animals with only a few cells, seawater worked. For multi-celled animals, blood was the evolutionary answer. So blood is actually a mixture of cells suspended in a slightly yellowish liquid called plasma. Plasma is made up mostly of water, but it also contains proteins, sugars, hormones, and salts. The three different types of cells you'll find in plasma are red blood cells, or erythrocytes, white blood cells, or leukocytes, and platelets, or thrombocytes. Each type of cell has a different function. Red blood cells give the blood its color and make up 40 to 45% of your blood. They're round and look a little like a donut without the hole in them. Their main job is to carry oxygen to the other cells of the body and to take away the carbon dioxide as a waste product. Red blood cells only live four months, but healthy bone marrow produces four to five billion red cells every hour to keep replenishing the ones that wear out. Isn't that amazing? White blood cells, on the other hand, are the body's defense system. There are three types of white blood cells, granulocytes, lymphocytes, and monocytes. They all fight infection from bacteria, viruses, all those nasty microbes that can cause disease. The granulocyte contains little granules, packages of proteins that have specific functions. These granulocytes are the body's first line of defense against invader germs. Whenever germs begin to infect your body, they send out a signal that the granulocyte recognizes. Just as soon as the granulocyte detects the signal, it begins its journey to the site of the infection. The granulocyte leaves the bloodstream and squeezes through the vessel walls, crawling through the maze of tissue, fibers, and cells in order to confront the enemy germ. When at last they find the invader germ, they quickly move in for the kill, first attacking the invader and then eating it. There are actually three kinds of granulocytes. Neutrophils, that kill bacteria by digesting it, eosinophils, that kill parasites, and basophils, which, well, we're still learning about them. There are two other types of white blood cells, lymphocytes and monocytes, and they have specific jobs too. Lymphocytes, and there are two kinds, produce antibodies and destroy foreign bodies. Monocytes, the biggest white cell of them all, eat bacteria and are our body's dead cells. I know all these white blood cells have strange names, but it's really something, the way they all work to keep us healthy. Something else that is truly amazing is how the platelets work. Platelets are small pieces of cell material, or cytoplasm, whose job it is to plug holes in the vessel walls. When they're not active, they circulate as tiny flattened discs. So say you're standing inside the blood vessel and looking at the tear in its wall. You'd see millions of platelets responding to the injury, throwing themselves over the cut. They stick to the wound's edges and to each other to form a plug that slows the loss of blood within three to five minutes. Then here's what happens. These platelets will eventually start breaking apart. So to maintain the clot, a complex chain reaction takes place that turns a protein found in the plasma into fibrin. 
This fibrin forms a dense net that traps red blood cells and quickly becomes a clot. A platelet plug will last for only 24 to 72 hours because the platelets run out of energy and begin to fall apart. But as long as there is still an unhealed hole in the blood vessel wall, the clot will continue being formed, dissolved, and reformed to stop and prevent more bleeding from occurring. When the wound is completely healed by the new cells growing over it, the clot will be cleared away and blood will begin to flow through the vessel normal. Platelets are the smallest kind of blood cell, but can you imagine what would happen if they weren't there? So, how does our body make all these different blood cells? Well, all the blood cells in your body are produced in your bones, inside the bone marrow. Bone marrow looks like a network of tiny little connected caves, similar to a honeycomb. Inside the bone marrow are special parent cells called stem cells. A stem cell is kind of a super cell that has the power to divide itself and produce a twin. This process of cell division is called mitosis. Through mitosis, the stem cell can keep creating more and more stem cells, just like itself. But amazingly, the stem cell also has the ability to turn into all the other different blood cells. It can actually differentiate into red cells, white cells, and platelets. Let's suppose the stem cell gets a message to differentiate and become a red cell. Well, inside the cell is the nucleus, which contains the cell's DNA and acts very much like a computer program. It directs the cell to produce the red protein, hemoglobin, that fills the red cells. It's this hemoglobin that not only gives red cells their color, but also the ability to bind and transport oxygen. After a period of time when the red cell is full of hemoglobin, the job of the nucleus is over and it gets kicked out. The red cell then leaves the bone marrow to join the billions of other adult red cells circulating in the bloodstream. When a stem cell is directed to make platelets, it turns into a kind of factory cell called a megakaryocyte. This process usually takes several days. The megakaryocyte is a very large cell with several nuclei. The megakaryocyte never leaves the bone marrow, but does produce many, many fragments. These are actually the platelets, small pieces of cell material or cytoplasm and they do leave the bone marrow and circulate freely in the bloodstream. And of course, stem cells can also become the many different kinds of white cells we talked about earlier. I think that's pretty impressive. So now you know what makes up your blood. But remember, I said it's basically a transport system. Well, let's explore that statement a little. What does it transport? Most of us probably know that blood is responsible for getting oxygen to every cell and taking carbon dioxide away. But do you know how it works exactly? Each time you take a breath, pairs of oxygen atoms called O2 molecules enter your lungs and pass through smaller and smaller tubes, or bronchi, until reaching tiny air sacs called alveoli. These air sacs are covered by thin blood vessels known as capillaries, and it's here that the gas exchange takes place. The oxygen molecules pass easily into blood vessels and bind or attach to our hemoglobin. Now loaded with this cargo of oxygen, the red cells first travel at a high rate of speed through the heart, the large aorta, and other big arteries, like on a freeway. But then they have to leave the freeway and travel down many narrow side streets, finally passing into even narrower and thinner capillaries. At this point, the capillaries are only one cell wide, and they have to squeeze and stretch and even fold themselves in half to get through. That's why red cells are flat and flexible, so they can easily change shape and fit through such small places. Only when they get deep inside the capillaries running through your muscles and tissues and organs do they finally release their load of oxygen. But that's only half of the trip, because as soon as they release the oxygen, they pick up carbon dioxide, the waste material released by the cells. Carbon dioxide, or CO2, consists of two atoms of oxygen and one atom of carbon. At this point in the journey, because they've released their oxygen and loaded up on carbon dioxide, the blood cells are not as bright red as they were before. What's more, they make the long return trip back to the lungs through the veins. Finally, as they complete the round trip, the carbon dioxide they carried back is released as you breathe it out through your lungs and mouth. That one complete round trip will take on average only 30 to 45 seconds. And if you're exercising, even less. Plus, just to make this even more amazing, the human body has so many miles of blood vessels inside of it that they could encircle the earth twice plus a little bit more. Okay, so the blood transports oxygen and carbon dioxide. The lungs are integral to this exchange, as is the heart, because it's pumping blood throughout your body. We've come a long way to understanding how blood works and what it does in our bodies. 
People used to believe that if you transfuse the blood of a sheep into a human being, the human being would take on the personality of a sheep. That is, he'd be more docile and, well, more sheep-like. In 1665, when they tried such a thing, no one realized you couldn't mix blood from one species to another. And it wasn't until 1900 that Carl Landsteiner, a Viennese physician, discovered that there are different blood types in humans. O, A, B, and AB. Blood typing is what makes it possible to transfuse blood from one person into another without producing life-threatening reactions. Type O can give blood to all their blood types, but they can only receive from type O donors. Type AB can receive from all groups. In the United States, about 45% of people are type O. It's the most common blood type, whereas 3 to 4% are type AB. You've probably heard about people being RH positive or RH negative as well. The RH groups are another system of antigens that's important to know about for transfusions and in pregnancies. Now you know a little bit more about your body and how it works. That blood constantly circulates around your body is quite something. Next, we'll be learning some amazing things about what's going on in blood research and science. To find out more about blood biology, visit mybloodyourblood.org. And remember, donating blood can save a life.